Um, and the talk that I want to give today is um, essentially over uh, how I see p or large organizations improving the way that they do software. And as you often hear about a lot of um, ways of improving your software nowadays in the DevOps world and uh, to some extent in what you might call the cloud native world, although the world of Kubernetes and cloud is currently obsessed with infrastructure, a lot of the focus is on what people would call culture or process or things like that. And I think, I think that can seem like a, an odd um, uh, sort of set of things that are hard to get your hands around as far as what to do. Um, you know, you're often told you, the most important thing to change about improving the way your organization does is to pay attention to the culture. And, and what the picture people paint sounds like a wonderful place to work, but it's hard to figure out how to get there. So I'm interested in studying how organizations actually uh, get to that, that stage where they've changed their, their organization over to something that's more beneficial for software. And I really do see a lot of what has been going on in the DevOps world, both technologically and uh, process-wise as addressing, uh, you know, the, the end goal that it has is improving the way that organizations do software. You know, to use a, an old quip, it's uh, you can automate your software all that you want and your deployments and all these things, but that doesn't really get you anything except automated deployments. Hopefully the software that you've automated is uh, useful as well. So there's a URL for the copy of these slides, and unless you want to like take screenshots uh, down there at the bottom. Um, and I, I try to put a lot of citations and footnotes in my slides. You don't just have to trust uh, the talking that I'm doing to it. So just to add briefly to the introduction, uh, this is me. That's, that's what I look at. And I've worked at all sorts of places uh, from being an industry analyst uh, to now working at Biddle. I have a podcast that I do, uh, several podcasts actually, but the main one that I do is called Software Defined Talk. And there's a pivotal one. And I've worked in mergers and acquisitions and other things while at Dell. A long time ago, I was a, a programmer, uh, maybe like 10 years or so now. So my, my knowledge is a bit old, but at least I know the, the general things that uh, software developers are up to. So to use a, uh, another joke, or a, another thing that ages me, a little bit of a joke here, a lot of what I encounter when I talk with organizations who are interested in DevOps, the way to do software is this phrase digital transformation which is a bit of a um i don't know uh maligned term nowadays people sort of make fun of it but like a lot of these terms i've been increasingly finding that uh, we don't have a better term so it's the one uh, that people want to use um, and when you're told it's time to do some digital transformation uh, particularly as, let's say, a staff person or maybe a manager of a development or an operations team, it feels a little bit like this situation, which, which I remember. You know, you're sort of going about your, your day, uh, your merry day, in, in your, your highly compensated and comfortable IT job. Uh, maybe you're doing some, like, uh, playing around with Captain Picard or something. And then, and then you're told that something wonderful is going to happen, and you see some sort of older person, usually who doesn't have much hair, that you've never seen come along. And uh, they tell you that this wonderful thing called digital transformation is gonna occur. And you're gonna completely change the way that you do software and you do your operations and it's gonna be great. And next thing you know, uh, you're in the midst of transforming and, and you think to ask like, how does this usually go for organizations? And uh, they tell you, oh, everyone usually just fails at it and it completely doesn't work for them. So maybe you'll be the one who figures it out. And, and that sort of like recurring pattern of, of people not doing very well at transforming the organization, again, is what I'm always interested in studying. How do people avoid doing the dumb things that uh, lead to them not being successful um, at changing the way they do their software? So first of all, I think given that kind of uh, struggling and uh, uh, hardship that it takes to improve your IT organization and the capabilities you have for software, it's good to have some motivation about why you would want to uh, change the way that you do software. And uh, I mean, if you'll pardon going over to the, the business side a little bit, I think, I think it's, it's useful to look at the way, the thing that is motivating large organizations. And there's a different version of this for um, government organizations and those who aren't um, interested in, in profit. That's, that's more or less the same. But what you see in the business world beyond sort of the usual uh, freaking out about um, technology-driven, what we would call tech companies, uh, 
uh, like your Airbnbs and your Ubers and all your payment sort of companies coming in is that it is harder and has been harder for large organizations to maintain their leadership position. And there's one measurement that comes out every now and then that sees how long companies have stayed at the, the top of uh, various stock markets as represented by the S&P 500. And you can see that the length of time that they, these organizations stay in a leadership position has been slowly declining. And every now and then going back up and down, it's a bit of a wave uh, since the, the mid 60s. But if you project out uh, just a, a decade or so uh, into the future, you can see that each, each decade, the, you know, it, it's harder and harder for an organization to stay in a leadership position. So this means that things are very challenging, uh, essentially, uh, for organizations. And what they need to do is find a new way to maintain their position because other organizations they're competing with, whether they're new entrants or existing ones, are using all sorts of things they have at their disposal to compete with them and win market share for them, so to be more successful than them. Now, of course, there's things beyond uh, technology and IT that uh, that people will be using, but I don't know. If, if you're attending this, you're probably like me. You're, you're an IT nerd, so you don't really have access to those other things. So it's good to pay attention to what we in the IT department have to help the organizations we work with um, maintain their position, be competitive, and be successful so that we don't have to find a new organization to work for. Now, the good news is uh, when I go out and survey how, let's call them regular and normal organizations are doing, not just organizations that are those well-fund startups that uh, for some reason have millions of dollars and don't seem to need to uh, turn a profit, they can just sort of spend their way into uh, success. There are many organizations that aren't in that position, and there's a few of them highlighted here, but it's encouraging to see how these organizations are actually turning around the older way of doing IT that they have, and they're ado adopting very agile-driven, very DevOps-influenced um, software development and release cycles where they can start, start releasing their software week and truly apply not only an agile approach to software, and not only a DevOps approach to thinking about how they manage that software in production and the full life cycle of it, but also a very well-designed and user-centric way of doing software. And as the middle column, what I'm interested in, as this um, quote from Gene Kim in one of his books goes over about DevOps, what becomes important are the outcomes or the things that you achieve with, with a DevOps approach. And so I'm always interested in tracking these middle things about how the business has been removed, like how uh, this company Liberty Mutual was able to double the selling rate of motorcycle insurance when they entered the Australian market, or how someone like the uh, the U.S. Air Force was um, in air jet refueling with their tanker by applying um, all of the the ways of doing software better. Now, over on the further right side, you can see sort of technical improvements that they had that helped contribute uh, to this. But when you're thinking about doing something like DevOps or improving how you're doing your software, it's always good to focus on this end goal. Why are we automating things? Why are we using a cloud platform? Why are we following a, an agile way of doing things? And you want to keep, keep your eyes on that, that actual outcome, being obsessed with how quickly uh, you can deploy something or how, how much your build pipeline allows you to build something and so forth and so on. It's, it's good to want to keep your eyes on that, but also be encouraged uh, that it's not just those startups out there that are doing this. It's these large, regular organizations. And I like to go over this because when I go talk with large organizations, one of the first questions that I get is, is often, well, it's more of a statement, is that we're a gigantic bank or, or a large government institution that has existed for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And uh, we still run COBOL and all sorts of other l large programming organizations. So all these great ideas that you're talking to us about, surely we can't do that because we're old and can't change. But in fact, and there's many other cases of nations who were in that same position were able to change over how they do software. So uh, the first thing to look at is figuring out what are the best practices for doing not only your software development or your product optimality of looking at the full life cycle of software, we're going to run this software presumably in production, uh, and so we should also think about how it can be operationable, how we can release it better, 
all the way back to development, which I think is one of the, as I'll get into a little bit later, one of the, the great insights of uh, DevOps. So the first thing is to think about what are not so great ways of doing software. And um, you know this this uh, this notion is from a presentation that the the U.S. Air Force gave just about a month or so ago about how they had been adopting things like DevOps and more of a agile way of doing their software. And one of the things that they pointed out, among other items, was that having a large process, uh, a multi-level process that you wrap around things, was probably at some point helpful. But when organizations like themselves are looking to deploy their software every week. A huge amount of process becomes more of a boat anchor for the, the the speed at which they want to move and isn't allowing them to move as quickly so they need to update the process the methodology that they're using and this starts to get a little bit about uh to that idea of culture and i was i was in um uh, thailand just a couple weeks ago and and as, as often sort of happens there was a, a fun visual representation of this where in the uh, kind of an, uh, forgotten corner of the conference room was this uh, RUP or Rational Unified Process poster, which, which I remember fondly because it's sort of how I learned to do uh, programming and think about development quite some time ago. But if you're in one of these situations where your organization wants to improve how it does software to get to those, those outcome doing business or satisfying the sort of government service needs that you have, it's important first to realize that if you've got a large process in place that takes many weeks or many months to just get to the point where you're writing code, that's going to be a huge uh, barrier that you have. Uh, so what is a, a way of thinking about software and process that organizations are using where they are rapidly getting to those good business outcomes, where they can not only deploy software every week, but also start to use that tool, use kind of the, the tools that DevOps gives them and the abilities that DevOps gets them to have much better software that allows the end users, the customers to interact better with the businesses that they have and hopefully satisfy the goals that their organizations have. So that's where this notion of, um, it has all sorts of names, whether you want to call it design or just software that isn't terrible. But I like to use the idea of uh, user-centric software, which is if your software is going to be used by people, and I suppose there's a, a uh, large amount of software that's not used by people. It's used by other machines or something like that. And so maybe there's machine-centric software. But when you have this idea of software used by a person, if, if you're, uh, you've worked on software for a while, you realize that it's really hard to predict the best way to implement a feature or write your software that uh, that will solve a user's problem. It's really an exploratory process that you have where you're constantly, you generally know the problem that you're going to solve, but sometimes that's, well, you don't even know the problem that you're going to solve well, but you generally have an idea of what your user wants to do. You know, they might want to pay a bill or you might have, have your field workers who are being sent out to repair power lines or home internet connections, you might have some software that's assigning them which work to go to. But knowing how exactly to write that software and how exactly to solve their problem is always a difficult uh, notion that you have. And we see this constantly, or at least I see it, the way that the development team or the product team has implemented a feature in the software doesn't exactly match to the way that I want to use it. And I end up having to spend a lot of time thinking about how the software works and then changing away the way that I operate to, to work with the software well. And, and I'll get to an example of this uh, right after going over uh, this next point, which is the general process and way of thinking that I see large organizations use when they want to be more user centric and how they're doing software. So this is a uh, very, very oversimplified to make it easy to explain uh, instance of this. But whenever you uh, encounter an unknown situation, a problem that you need to solve, I think this general loop is over the, the centuries what uh, humans, maybe other animals use this, but I'm no biologist, but that humans have uh, used. Here is that you have an unknown problem in front of you. And to use a very disciplined structure way to solve that problem, you come up with a theory or a hypothesis of, of what that, that problem may be. Uh, so I'll, again, I'll go over an example after this uh, briefly. And then you think of a way, how would I validate if my theory of how to solve the problem was true or not? 
And in software, the way that you validate that is one, you write software, and two, uh, you sort of run the experiment. You put it in front of actual end users and you see if it solves their problems in the parameters that you have. Um, and that putting it in front of end users, you can probably start to think is is of a huge part of where this value that's something like DevOps brings you, where you can deploy your software every week or every day. And it allows you to observe if you're, the way your theory solves their problems. And then based on that, if it didn't solve their problems, you can try to solve it another way. And if it did solve their problem, then, uh, you know, congratulations, there's another problem you can solve. And so this way of chipping away and also solving that problem, this kind of small batch loop is what you see organizations using uh, who are successful at improving their software function. Now, this has all sorts of names. I mean, I'm just stealing this from all people. Uh, you know, there's the lean startup idea that has this loop in it. There's a whole bunch of right applying lean startup to, you know, lean enterprise thinking and in actual lean manufacturing, there's the plan, do, check, act or PDCA loop. And also people in this, uh, this area seem to love the, uh, the, uh, the sort of U.S. Air Force's idea made by this guy, Colonel Boyd of the OODA loop or the OODA loop, which is something that they teach fighter pilots to evaluate a situation, decide what to do and act and constantly be responding to the, uh, the changing business environment in, uh, in the skies, if, if you will. Uh, so what's an example of putting this loop into place? How does having a weekly or a daily loop that allows you to do this improve the software that you have? So I'll give you an example here based on the, uh, the IRS. The, uh, if you're not familiar with them, uh, the, up here in, in the US, it's the uh, tax collection agency that we have. You can imagine, perhaps the uh, sarcastically put, most beloved government organization that we get to interact with up here. Um, so the, when people uh, don't pay their taxes on time, uh, which is, I guess, an unfortunate situation for everyone involved, uh, you're delinquent in your taxes. And the way the IRS notifies you, so to speak, of that is every single day they increase the penalty that you owe on your taxes. So people are highly motivated to find out on that day how much taxes they owe so that they can pay that off so that the next day they don't owe more taxes. Now, for a long time, the way the IRS solved this problem is they had a call center. Uh, you know, you would pick up the telephone and call someone, uh, we'll call the IRS, and there was a call center manned by, by people who would look up on their machine, and I imagine there was some green screen application that they were madly typing away in, like a, a gate agent at the airport does, and they would look up how much you owed so that you could pay it off then. Now, of course, call centers are relatively expensive compared to not having one, and instead of having uh, software, for example. And also, we up here in the US, it's not like we like to uh, sufficiently fund the IRS, so their, their budget is always shrinking and they need to optimize costs. And as a consequence, uh, there was a study that said the calls were only actually answered about 37% of the time when you would call into the IRS. And what this meant, to put it another way, uh, that's more of an IT way, is that there was only 37% uptime. And so I would imagine um, in your job, if you only had 37% availability for your applications, uh, you would probably not be working at your organization anymore. That would be a terrible failure. So uh, for all of these reasons, the IRS thought, what we should do is we should solve this problem by having some software. Now, traditionally, the way that most organizations, and especially government organizations, our US government organizations would work, is they would write up a huge amount of documents. They would probably source it out to, to someone else to do. And then maybe two or three late years later, they would launch the software they would have their piece of software that was trying to solve the problem. And if you think back to this idea of solving software is a series of solving unknown problems, they would have had to take a huge gamble on their idea of how to solve it. And indeed, because they were following a small batch process, they could kind of watch themselves discover this every week as they came up with a new theory and, and changed it and tweaked it. But their first idea, how they solved it, and you can see that on the left side, put in orange uh, the thing you're supposed to find, uh, just so you can cheat. But they would show a complete financial history uh, of someone's use of the software. And people would get lost in, in all of this information, and they would want to pick up the phone and call 
So this would have been, after a couple of years, a complete failure of the system, right? They wouldn't have solved the person's uh, problems. But because they were following the small batch process, they were able to observe how people were using the software, how it was failing, and completely hone it and get to the situation afterwards, which sounds ridiculous uh, when you go over it. But it turns out when you want to know how much money you owe the IRS, all you want to know is how much money you owe the IRS, which is the, the UI that they presented to them. And then people would not want to pick up the phone and uh, they would actually pay their taxes off there. So what they found after deploying this is there were 2 million users who started using this, which is a bit distressing. It means 2 million people weren't paying their taxes on. We should go back to our civics class and uh, tell them they should pay their taxes if they like all their highways and, and other government services. And they brought in almost half a, million, half a billion dollars of taxes with it, right? So it's a, it's a great success in applying a more user-centric way of doing software. Now, I go over this at length. It's a very simple um, example of this. But it shows the importance and the success of putting that small batch process in place, of benefiting from all the, the benefits that you get from DevOps, the results you get from DevOps, to put uh, a weekly software uh, release cadence in, in, in effect. And also, I think, shows the point that just because you can release your software weekly, that's only half of the story. The other half is actually putting a user-centric process in place to improve the software that you have. So how, how are large organizations getting to this point where they actually have the technology in, in place to release uh, their software weekly, but also are able to um, have a user-centric design uh, way of putting, putting their software in production? How do they change the culture as, as you would hear about? Well, what I see in large organizations is it's and sort of ends, if you will, with the management layer. So if you have one, two, or maybe even five teams of developers, it's very easy to change how your organization does software. But if you think about the scale of regular larger organizations, right? Some there's someone like a JP Morgan Chase has anywhere between 19 and 25,000 developers, depending on how you count them. And changing over how all those developers and the product managers do software is incredibly hard. And that, at that kind of scale, is really the job of management. And just as we expect developers and operations and designers to change over how they are doing their jobs day to day and week to week, the job of management changes over quite a lot as well. So for you know, what I see is organizations still, at the, when it comes to management and leadership, need to do the same things of figuring out what the strategy is. How, what are the goals that they have? What are the kind of business notions that they have, right? Like, so for example, in many, many different uh, countries, uh, a lot of the, the strategy that banking has is we would like to have uh, mobile payments. There are a lot of people who uh, don't have bank accounts at all, sort of purely cash oriented people. And our vision and our strategy is that we would like to start selling products to these people who don't use banking. And so we need to go out write some software and figure out how we get them involved in banking in a way that works with what their daily sort of cash workflow is. Uh, and and I, was, I was just in Indonesia a few weeks ago, and this is definitely a huge thing that motivates uh, banking there as, and many other countries as well. So someone needs to establish that as the vision and the strategy. But things uh, sort of rapidly change there from what management typically does. And as we'll get into, you'll be changing your organization structure. When you have, as, as you have in a DevOps team, all these roles on the same team, the way that you compensate people and the um, human resources plans that they operate under, all of these things start to change from the old way of doing things to more support the new way of doing things, right? Because the tool that management has to motivate staff is there's a bit of uh, visionistic uh, motivation that they can give them. But at the end of the day, or more likely at the end of the year, the only tool that management has to change how people operate is how they compensate them and the policy that they operate under. And so management needs to, for example, go work with HR and change how people's careers are managed based on the new way they want them to operate and how they're paid and how their bonuses are done, which again is not something that an individual team can do very well. It's management's job uh, to do that as well. And then as I'll get to at the end, management also has a huge job to do with other managers and other leadership in the company to not only argue for budget for this change and uh, sort of cover for it, but to start to scale that change to a larger organization and convince the rest of the organization to change how they're doing things as well. Now, 
uh, I go over all of this because, again, it's very easy in a DevOps world to get obsessed with your, your automation and even your monitoring and sort of culture in a team. But if you're working in a large organization, it's very important, especially as an individual staff person, to see if management is changing as well. And if management isn't changing the way that it's doing things, you probably are not going to be too successful as an organization at, uh, uh, at transforming. And you'll sort of end up at the same place you were, just with different posters on the wall and different books on your bookshelf than you had at the end. But you'll still have those sad posters uh, in the corner. So uh, as mentioned, one of the first things that management I see in, in successful organizations change is how their organization, and I'm sure if you've heard any sort of DevOps talk, you've heard about silos versus uh, unified teams. I mean, it's sort of right there in the idea of DevOps that you're bringing together developers and operations people. But I still see this at pretty much every large organization I talk with who hasn't yet transformed, is that the IT department is arranged around a functional organization or silos to use the jargon of the DevOps world. And, you know, I haven't gone to go look this up, but I think at some point it was the optimized way as far as efficiency, risk management, uh, um, and maybe cost controls to arrange things in this way, where you had, you know, your enterprise architects in one group, your security people in another group, the infrastructure managers in a group, the application development people in their own group, and the database people and the networking. Uh, and I assume that was a great way of operating. Uh, where you would sort of check out these people. Uh, people have been finding when they want to improve the way their software is done is if you're releasing your software every week or every day, I mean, it, it will take you a week just to schedule meetings with all these various people, with your enterprise architects or your dat DBAs to, to do your databases. It takes a long time to coordinate across these different silos, and that just eats up a lot of your time. Now, of course, this isn't to mention the more cynical problems of, and this goes back to why management is important, is each of these silos is differently compensated and differently motivated uh, about what, what, they, what their job is, right? So, uh, you know, DBA people, it's important for them to keep databases in a good state and to uh, maintain whatever referential integrity is. And so they're not always too interested in rapidly changing things like your application developers may be. And so the incentives aren't aligned across these silos. And over the years and over the decades, they tend to be battling with each other and uh, cause all sorts of issues. So what I see in successful organizations uh, who are improving how they do so their software is they arrange in these more, uh, what I would call kind of a product team oriented way. So they bring together not only all the roles, but, but the people needed to support an application or a service into one team. And these ten teams tend to be a small amount of people, you know, four to maybe 12 to at most 16 people. Uh, and they tend to be developers and the designers that you, you may need, the product managers, uh, operation skilled people, and sometimes depending on, on the, uh, the product that you're working on, the software you're working on, you might have specialists like a data scientist if it's a data heavy thing or something like that. And, there is t still sort of this idea of maybe there's a role or some skills you only need for like a week and they tend to get sort of checked out to those teams um, like a library, not like someone not paying attention to their work. But you have these teams who are dedicated only to the software that they're working on and they work on it for a long term. And this is just what we do in the software industry is we don't have all these different roles not working with each other. We have, because we're developing a product, that's the way that we generate our revenue, sort of the most important thing that we're doing, um, I guess other than sales, of course. Sales is always important if you're looking to make money with software. But we, we have these dedicated teams of all the roles that you need working on the software. So this is taken from a, a great uh, talk that Cornelia did uh, that kind of goes over this more in depth. But this is the first thing that management is always faced with across companies I've worked with, like uh, Duke Energy, uh, Allstate, Humana, all these various large organizations that are fixing how they do software, is they reorganize people into these product teams that are fully dedicated uh, to the product that they have. So the next logical question is, what do these product teams look like? And what are the, the things that they're doing? So as, as mentioned, these teams work with each other everyone on a weekly basis, right? They don't just see their product manager every few months to hear what requirements and the features are. They don't just talk with QA people, you know, at the end of a release cycle. Uh, 
they actually are working together every day, thinking about the exact release that they're working on, how users are using their software, and getting increasingly familiar with it. Um, and you know, as as pictured here, they often have these uh, these exciting open areas, and as we'll get into, they're often pairing together, and they're working together um, in a very concerted way to to solve their problems. And inexplicably, there's always lots of sticky notes involved. So you know, that's something you can look forward to. Tell your office facilities people you need to order a bunch of some boxes of sticky notes because apparently you'll be using lots of those. But when you look at the skills that developers have, the first thing that I think is very important to look at is if we're looking to do software the best way possible, are we actually following best software processes out there as far as developing the software, testing it, uh, deploying it, and managing the whole life cycle of software? And this may seem like a sort of pedantic or basic thing to suggest, but when you look at surveys uh, like this one, what you find is that most organizations or a surprisingly large amount of organizations are not actually following the best practices that we've developed over the last quarter of a century. So this survey is, it's a bit dated. It's last year's survey that Gartner does of agile practices uh, in place. And if you look at the blue lines, um, the, this is the percentage of survey respondents who, have, who were doing these, these processes uh, at the time of the survey. Now, of course, the green says uh, we're planning on doing these processes which I always take to mean we're never gonna actually do these processes. They're just sort of stuck in that planning PowerPoint that someone uploads to their, uh, their SharePoint uh, site somewhere and then they're done with that. They don't actually need to make sure they, they implement them, them. Maybe I've worked in a call. Um, but if you look at this, you can see that things drop off very quickly um, as far as best practices uh, that you would be following if you're doing software well. So even if you may have, as organizations are fond of telling me, just certified 500 or 1,000 Scrum Masters, and therefore you, you must be assured that you're doing these Agile practices. It's really good uh, if you're on a team yourself or you're one of these management people who's trying to transform to actually go out and assess if you're following these practices because the chances are high that there's at least several teams in your group that are not following practices. So the next thing that the teams do, and I made a joke about uh, sticky notes, is if you're following the small batch process, right? Like every week, you're putting some new features into production. And more so, you're not just incrementally solving some big stack of requirements that you had, but you're studying if what, what features you're going to put into, um, you know, you're going to work on and release next week is going to be more fluid than if you had one of these large three ring binders that you can just sort of plan out in a uh, sort of a time marched way of doing things. And so this doesn't mean that you're completely ignorant about what you're going to do in a month. Again, like I was saying, you generally know the problem that you're solving, right? Like we know that we'll probably be, if we're the IRS, retrieving people's um, information about the taxes they owe. So at some point, we're going to make a service that interacts with that system. And we're going to have to present that UI. So we're going to need a UI that presents the financial information that they have. But what, what I see organizations avoiding is, is on the left there, that large, and nowadays I suppose it's emailed instead of printed out, that large three ring binder that has, uh, you know, five level deep subsections that are numbered going over what the, you know, what, what a print screen looks like for your historic bills and exactly detailing what that looks like. And instead they have um, oftentimes whether it's uh, digital, if you will, in sort of some online Kanban board or backlog manager, whether it's like uh, something like Pivotal Tracker or um, Trello or whatever Atlassian products you might use, um, they tend to have essentially um, post-it note sized ideas of what a story or a feature is. And they manage them a lot more fluidly and they evolve over time. And they take this much more, um, well, I guess literally agile approach to it. So this has great benefits for enabling that small batch process. But as this quote from uh, someone at the US Air Force goes over, it also is a really interesting way of doing risk management, right? So if you think about that, that IRS case, if they had delivered that software at the end of a year to be charitable or two years, and it didn't solve the problem, they would have spent a tremendous amount of money and not solve the problem, right? So that's a huge amount of risk that they were taking on that could have been uh, maybe not career ending, but wouldn't have improved the reputation of the IRS. And instead, if you're able to adjust, let's say on a monthly basis, what you're doing, 
you can manage your risk much better because you can always you always have you have 12 windows you know tw as depending on what months you take off a vacation you have many opportunities during during the year to change what it is you're doing and better manage that risk and there's also some budgetary interesting ways that you can do gated funding to control the budget that you have but Overall, organizations are finding that this small batch way of doing requirements management is a much improved way of doing things. So again, this is not only a piece of advice learned from high performing organizations, but a way that you can investigate if your organization is actually improving the way they're doing things. If you're still emailing around and figuring out how to attach to OneDrive or your SharePoint site or Dropbox or G Drive or whatever you use, some gigantic Word document that details the next two years of features, you probably need to go improve that process and stop doing that because it's probably indicative that you're not following the best processes out there. So then when you look at what the teams actually do, these product teams, right? So again, as just to emphasize that you tend to have all the roles that you need uh, on that team, right? And all of them focus on uh, each release cycle and at the beginning of, of larger chunks of release cycles what are the features that we're going to be working on? Let's make sure everyone knows down to the developer, to an architect, to an operations person, who, who the people are that are our customers and our users. Let's all go through the process of selecting things that we have. Um, let's all start to think more in a test-driven way from developer to operations people. Um, and definitely, um, we need to have a, an automated build pipeline, continuous delivery uh, pipeline in place, which I find that many organizations overlook. They think that because they have a continuous integration, a way of automating builds, they're sort of done. But they miss the bigger picture of having an actual build pipeline that automates not only building and testing, but packaging and setting up configuration, all the way to automatically being able to deploy to production uh, if they wanted to. And these are... Um, aside from the one in the, the upper right-hand corner, pictures of, of teams and actual regular organizations doing this. And again, I think it's valuable to get a notion that you don't have to be one of these startups to do this. You can, you can be people who actually wear button-up shirts and tuck them in and wear polo shirts, not just uh, startup people in uh, their Thor and Iron Man t-shirts and uh, flip-flops who do it. Uh, everyone else can participate as well. So one, one practice that I like to pull out in particular, and this is um, a screw screenshot from, from a video going for how Volkswagen does this, um, which is, you know, fun to look at if you want to uh, hear some German, which is a delightful language, um, is that I see large organizations who are successful with this. They, they think about doing rotated pairing. And so you might remember from your extreme programming uh, reading that uh, paired programming, where two developers sit with each other and they both look at the same screen and they write code and run tests. And this seems a little nutty at first, like you're going to have your productivity and double your cost, but it's, it's become apparent that paired programming increases the quality and the knowledge sharing and actually the velocity that teams have because you have two people working on this. But you also see pairing being used across all the roles for product managers, designers, operations people, and the same benefits of having higher quality uh, software or work product like with designers sharing knowledge and getting a better sense of how uh, everything is working in the system occurs when you pair up on those other roles. So that is something that I see teams doing that is very successful in these organizations is they kind of get over the weird accounting notions of this and they pair up people, which as I'll get into uh, in the last part is also a great way to scale up this chain, actually train trainers, if you will, who then go to other teams and pair with people and train these new people how uh, to do, do their work. So then um, I've gone this whole way, even though, you know, I ostensibly said, said this is not really a DevOps talk, I'm not talking about DevOps or the getting uh, part of release management and automation. And, you know, I think the story of DevOps, as, as told in my head by myself, is essentially the story of breaking down uh, this idea of the wall of confusion, as I think coined by my, my friend and now boss, uh, Andrew Schaefer, that you know, developers were very good at, uh, at some point in the 2000s at doing a monthly scrummish kind of release. Every 30 days, they could have a golden release or whatever that's called when you don't actually have a, a DVD or a CD-ROM printed. Um, and this software could be released. But going back to that functional organization thing, you know, the job of operations was to keep uh, production up. And if they knew anything, it was that every time they deploy the developer's release, production comes down. So a smart person who needs to pay their mortgage or their rent or uh, their kids' schooling or things, 
they would realize if they wanted to be paid well, they should just never release software, which is, of course, ridiculous. But they can all also go back to releasing software as little as possible. So obviously, if you want to deploy to, to users every week and observe the software, this is not going to be a tenable way to run, run your organization. So a lot of what came about uh, in doing DevOps came from this idea of how do we break that team down? And to summarize a great deal of work, and finally, I think in the past two years, there's a very detailed way of thinking about what are the practices of DevOps, how do we switch people over, how do we make people want to, not make, but how do we move people over to wanting to work um, together? Um, there's a great book out uh, by uh, the DevOps report people called Accelerate, which is kind of the 300-page uh, version of the annual DevOps report. Uh, that's, that's definitely well worth looking into if you're interested in all the details. Um, but how do we get people to work together? And, and my way of summarizing it is that we treat the entire process of software uh, like software development. So, and we also have an idea of, of what operations looks like. So we have developers be more cognizant of, and be more responsible for how things are running in production, right? Uh, how they should actually be aware of the issues that come up and write their software to run well in production, which again sounds ridiculous, but I remember when I was the developer, that wasn't really one of our priorities. That was someone else's problem. But then also, equally, the operations people should start treating production like development itself, and not only doing something which seems crazy but obvious, like checking configuration in, but they take on this site reliability engineer or SRE idea of we should automate or program everything as much as possible, and doing anything manually is a bad idea. And so you reset these priorities, and you, you think about your software development cycle as being every single part of the software lifecycle, including running it. And again, a lot of the, the details of this are, are, are written up very well nowadays. But that's a lot of how what I think DevOps is addressing is not just having these two separate roles, um, uh, thinking about how they solve their own problems and therefore slowing down that release cycle and therefore meaning that you can't uh, have a small batch process in place. So in response, uh, what you end up seeing very frequently is that organizations end up building platforms, as, as I like to think of them. And we did a white paper at Pivotal, and, and you can guess what the, the conclusion is of how you should satisfy this need, which I'll let you go into and look at yourself if you want to. But if you look at all of the functionality need when you take this larger uh, view of software and looking at the full picture, you can find all the different services and components that you need to pay attention to as a team and as the, the, platform, pe the platform operations people supporting it. So you not only pay attention to things like putting a build pipeline in place, uh, worrying about your middleware and you know how you package up software, but of course you pay attention to, to security. And of course you pay attention to the way that you're monitoring and doing things. Because again, as the product team, all of this is, is what you care about in software, right? You don't only care about generating that build if you're the development team. And if you're an operations person, you don't only care about isolating what this buggy software is and then rolling back the software. You all care about the full picture. So because no one person or team of people can actually manage all of this, you create or you acquire a platform that automates a tremendous amount of this. And in, as you look at this, you want to think about how do I automate this and make many of these components something that I don't have to worry about, right? I want to work every week when I do a release cycle, I only want to worry about the software that I have, not worry about how I set up SSL certificates or how I make sure that uh, our firewall and load balancing is set up. How do I automate some, some other system worry about that for me? Which is, you know, what you see in the large organizations who are successful at applying DevOps and definitely all of the, uh, the big name tech companies uh, that we would think about, right? Like when, when as, as happened recently, when a new version of Gmail comes out, it's not like the product team working on it thinks about all of these, these small issues of deployment and configuration and things like that. As, as well documented, there's an internal platform at Google and at, at Netflix and all these other places. And also at those companies that I was highlighting, like Allstate and Liberty Mutual and, and at the Air Force and uh, all sorts of organizations that are taking care of this for you instead of having development teams uh, worry about it themselves. So, you know, just briefly, we have a way of solving that problem. There you go. There's my only uh, way of getting paid today. You can check that out if you're interested. So when you get to this point uh, where you've gotten a form developing their, de deploying their software every week, getting into that virtuous cycle of using a small batch process, 
in a large organization, what counts is not just doing one, two, or five teams, like I was saying, but how do we change over the entire organization uh, to improve how they're doing software? And again, this is what I'm uh, most interested in and what I've, I've studied um, because I've worked in large organizations and the frustration is always, how do we change everyone over to doing that? So uh, here's, it's still early on. Um, I would say we're only like three at most four years into this, which seems like a long time, but in the grand scheme of, of 10 to 15 years to change over how organizations operate is just the beginning. There's a couple of observations and sort of uh, cases that, that I've encountered that go over how organizations are scaling. Um, and you know, they're, they're, if you want to look up this presentation, there's one interesting presentation from FedEx of how they're integrating their, their sort of startup-y way of doing things back into the main line and how they continuously kind of check in and uh, change over how they're, they're, they're doing things. And they've got this wonderful hand-drawn uh, illustration, which, which I love to use here. But to extract some of the principles, and again, this goes back to why management is so important and why leadership is important. Um, how I see organizations starting off, uh, which, is, which is critical, um, is they start off smaller than you would think. So they start off with a small group of applications. And as illustrated there on the left, they slowly scale up to more and more applications. So this is, this is important because when it comes to change management in a large organization, the first thing that you're battling against is um, other parts of the organization saying that you're using a poor methodology and therefore because it's failed early on, you should not try to do it, right? Like, Unfortunately, in many large organizations, there's this sort of zero-sum competition where um, everyone's battling for resources. And if, if you are in one part of the organization and you're trying to change how you're doing things, rival parts of the organization may see that as attracting more budget and more attention uh, away from them. And so therefore, they're on the lookout for you failing very early. And they'll use that, uh, again, very unfortunately, as a tool to say why they should be getting those resources and you should be getting less. So to, this is a precarious situation to be in when you're trying to try something new because you're going to screw it up and fail at it. Or, or to use a synonym, you're going to be learning how to do things in a new way. So you want to choose small applications that won't cause cut, uh, uh, big failure uh, that will kill your initiative early on. Now, on the other hand, you want to choose real applications that aren't just like conference room scheduling applications or things like that. Because as you work on these applications, you're also going to be building up uh, a bunch of success cases that you use to argue your point that you should be given more resources and more scope and that, so that you can use to win over the organization for it. And so that's what the example on the left shows is over about the first year, how Home Depot, the large hardware retailer, picked a series of small applications. And as they learned how to do things in this new way and... Uh, switch teams over and had success, they ramped up the number of applications that they had more and more and more. So for example, one of the applications they picked early on was the software used to drive the paint desk in their store, um, matching custom paint uh, for people who would come in uh, instead of just off the shelf paint. Um, and that was a real business, uh, but it was a small enough business that as they learned and, and they failed every now and then at doing it correctly, it wouldn't negatively impact the overall transformation process. And now they do more and more software as over the past uh, couple of years, they've built up success with it. So it's always good in a large organization to set pacing expectations and very carefully pick the applications that you'll be doing over time. And I've just picked from a few uh, large organizations the amount of applications they did in the first year. And I think a large part of this, it's important because many people, when they start off with wanting to change things, they, uh, they start too big. And that often creates problems because if you, if you choose too large of a scope, as any developer or someone who's worked on software will know, you won't be able to achieve all of that scope and you'll fail at it. And, uh, and then that gets you a bad reputation and you sort of revert back to the old way of doing things. So make sure to set your expectations uh, correctly and uh, don't feel bad if you're not solving all of your organization's problems, even the big, the big difficult problems in, in the first year or so. So then finally, um, the other thing that I see large organizations uh, that I'll mention here doing is they do a tremendous amount of internal marketing and training and uh, education in their organization. Now, it may be the case that you already do a lot of uh, marketing internally and training, but chances are extremely high organizations I've seen uh, do. Um, and 
every quarter, many of these organizations will have internal conferences, like Verizon does this and several other organizations uh, that, that I've worked with or that are documented, for example, in that, that Forrester report down there. And they'll go globally to their different organizations. And like this conference, they'll host it online and record it. But people will be in person to hear from each other, very importantly, to hear from other people in the organization, projects they've worked on, lessons learned, and even more detailed things uh, like I'm going over here. So it's not only training that they're doing, but they're building up trust in the rest of the organization and spreading out um, how that change is effective uh, to other people in the organization. And then, of course, they do internal marketing beyond just like those sort of like monthly newsletters uh, that people send out. And they're also building up this content internally to change over how, how people are doing things and to really educate them. So is they actually, you know, you actually um, allocate people and resources and the time of all of your staff, which may seem overwhelming, to attend these internal conferences, to do this inter internal training and actually build up the skills and the knowledge of how they work from each other. And key to this, I think, is um, as kind of great out there, you can see myself and some of my coworkers helping out with one of these internal conferences. But you don't want to so much get external people like me because at the end of the day, we just want you to buy the products that we have so we don't have that much trust uh, that, that we can give people. But if you're talking with each other internally, you should trust each other more uh, and you can kind of hone the exact steps that you've gone to how you actually work internally and you can have a much better education uh, process for what you're doing. So finally, um, if, if you're really interested in these kind of topics, we have uh, an annual conference that we do up there in Washington, DC. Uh, if you're interested in it, it's in September. And I would encourage you, if you're really interested in these topics, I've referenced many of them. But we have recorded session from these and other things from the community where I've basically stolen all this content from customers going over uh, these tips. And uh, but there's a little discount code there you can use. I think I get a really nice pin or something if I get enough people registered. So, you know, I always need pins. You should uh, check out that conference. And also, I skipped over many things here um, uh, I, and to fit it into this time. But there is a, uh, a free uh, booklet that I have, uh, a little PDF. I think it's about 49 pages. I, it's, it's in English, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on what you like to read. I guess there's also a Chinese version, which I've never actually read. I'm not sure what's in it. But it goes over things in much more detail and cover things like finance and outsourcing and other items uh, that I didn't have time to cover here. So with that, I always like to end with this quote from the Agile Manifesto, because I think it's what I've ended up focusing on and uh, what, what Pivotal and the team that I do there and so many other people focus on is figuring out better ways of doing software. And, and I think as you figure these things out, it's really good to uh, pay attention to the last part, which is you know, it's one thing to know on your own how to do things, but it's really valuable if you go out and if only in your organization, help other people do it and talk about how you've improved things. So with a little bit of time left, I'm happy to uh, take any questions uh, that y'all have. But uh, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk about these topics.